Thanks to Interpret Europe for um, It's a real pleasure and honor uh, to be speaking here, to be speaking in Kozak. I've never been uh, to this part of Hungary before, and it's a, a wonderful place, a wonderful place to visit, so to find, uh, and to discover. I also need to start with an apology. I am not part of, I'm not a heritage professional. I know nothing about interpretation, at least in the way that most people in this room know about interpretation. So what I'm going to do is not talk about heritage and interpretation in the way that you might talk about it, but to provide a broader frame, if you like, a broader historical and political frame in which to think about issues of history and heritage, identity and interpretation. To question some of the assumptions that underlie heritage and interpretation. Hopefully not to ruffle too many feathers. Um, unfortunately I find that part of my role these days is to ruffle feathers. I hope I don't need it um, too many times. But let me begin with a question with, with a skeleton. Not a skeleton in a cupboard, but a skeleton in a cave. It was discovered in 1903 in a place called Goss Cave in Somerset in southwest England. And he became known as Cheddar Man. He was the oldest, he is the oldest, almost complete skeleton of a modern human being ever found in Britain. And in the 1970s, uh, radiocarbon dating showed him to be about 10,000 years old. Uh, who came to Britain uh, shortly after the first settlers crossed from continental Europe uh, to Britain at the end of the uh, last ice age. And in the last few years, scientists have managed to get uh, extract DNA from his skull and from his genome to reconstruct what he might have looked like 10,000 years ago. And that reconstruction was published about a month ago. And it suggested that Cheddar Man had dark, almost black skin. It's a finding that's consistent with a number of Mesolithic human remains found in Europe um, over the years. But it caused a sensation in Britain. A figure that you know, few had known outside of academic circles, suddenly became part of the national conversation. And the headlines, you can imagine the headlines, the first Britons were black. <laughs> and for many liberals, Cheddar Man <coughs> demolished the link between Britishness and whiteness, as one commentator put it. It's the director of a, of a film about Cheddar Man, even linked him to debates about Brexit. <laughs> what he shows is that, is that everything is in flux, and that's what we need to keep in mind today. So it speaks to us now. <coughs> For racists, on the other hand, Cheddar Man was not really a Briton. And the reconstruction was really a, 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 an indication of science having uh, uh, been taken over by political correctness. In reality, of course, Cheddar Man does not speak to us now in the way that most people would like him to. He has no bearing <clears throat> on contemporary debates on race or genetics or identity, still less on Brexit. He may have possessed a, a dark skin, but he's not black in the way we use the term now. Race, blackness, whiteness, these are all modern terms and have no bearing on humans that lived 10,000 years ago. Humans who lived 10,000 years ago are distinct from all humans today, whatever their skin colour. But what the debate about Cheddar Man shows is how the past is ever present in the present. The past is a resource with which to buttress the present, and the debate about Cheddar Man is one expression 
of the way their heritage, whether genetic or artistic or literary or, or architectural, uh, is increasingly becoming politicised. A means of presenting the past in a way that helps define the present from a, a particular political or moral viewpoint. There's nothing new, of course, in mining the past to find the resources through which to reinforce a, a particular vision of the present. That's happened um, throughout history. But what is different today, I think, is the social context in which we define our relationship to the past. We live, we, lots of people have talked about identity. We live in an age in which identity has become a key, a central feature of our lives, but in a different way than in the past. Identity is one of those kind of confused, confusing issues. We talk about identity politics. And that's become one of the key fault lines in contemporary politics. But few people would be able to say, what do we mean by identity politics? For some, all politics is identity politics. For others, it's an essential component of defense of the rights of minority groups. For others, it's a divisive approach which has helped create a more fragmented society, helped fuel the rise of populism. Identities are, of course, of great significance. They give each of us a sense of ourselves, of our grounding in the world, and of our relationship to others. But the relationship between identity and politics is a highly complex one. One's identity, or identities, because I one never has a single identity, one has many identities. Um, and what one's identity is depends on who you're talking to. If you ask me who am I, it depends on who, are, who, are, who I'm talking to. Um, who am I to my daughter is very different from who am I to any of you in this room. Who am I always depends on the context of the person you're talking to. And one's identities shapes inevitably one's political vision of the world. And one's political vision of the world gives form, in a sense, to one's identities. But politics is also, or should be also, a means of taking us beyond the identities given by the specific circumstances of our lives. As a teenager, I was drawn to politics because of my experience of racism. But if I was drawn, if it was racism that drew me to politics, it was politics that allowed me to see beyond the narrow confines of racism. I came to learn that there was more to social justice than challenging the injustices done to me. And that a person's skin colour or ethnicity or culture provides no guide to the validity of his or her political or moral beliefs. Through politics, I was introduced to the ideas of the Enlightenment, and to the concepts of a common humanity and universal rights. Through politics, too, I discovered the writings of a host of new writers. Mill and Baldwin and Arendt and James and Van Omer, people who I probably would not have otherwise read, but through my interest in politics. Most of all, I discovered that I could often find solidarity and commonality with those whose ethnicity or culture was different to mine, but who shared my values. Now, with many with whom I shared a common ethnicity or, 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 or culture, but not the same political vision. Politics, in other words, did not reinforce my identity, but helped me reach beyond it to create new forms of identities for myself. One of the shifts in recent years, I think, is that identities have become much narrower 
are more parochial, modelled less by the possibilities of a transformative future than by a mythical past. And politics, far from taking us beyond the narrow identities given to us by the particularities, the specifics of our lives, has often become defined by them. One's beliefs and interests seem determined by one's membership of particular biological or cultural faith identity groups. Today, you know, we often make sense of the world less as liberals or conservatives or socialists than as Muslim or American or white. What is all this to do with heritage of policy? The changing relationship between politics and identity expresses also a changing relationship to the past. And it expresses a transformation in the place of culture and social discourse. We've talked, I mean, there's been a lot of talk about the importance of culture in, in the way we, we, we look at the world. I want to suggest that actually it's probably because of two important that the way we look at culture is often problematic. If you look back over the past few decades, the centrality of many of the categories we used to define European politics, class for instance, has faded. And at the same time, culture has become an increasingly important medium through which people perceive and understand their social differences. And this is all part of a, a wider set of changes, political changes that are taking place. The, the old distinction between left and right, for instance, as it's many acknowledge, has become less meaningful. All forms of collective life, often based around class, have weakened. In politics, universal traditions are playing well particular traditions have gained strength. And institutions that traditionally help socialise individuals and give them a broader sense of their identity and their relationship to the world, from trade unions to the church, have lost much of their power. We live today, it seems to me, more fragmented, atomised society. And one of the consequences of these shifts is that people have begun to view themselves and their social affiliations in a different way. They have come to possess much narrower visions of what it means to belong and to anchor belonging more starkly in terms of ethnicity or culture or faith. The question many people want to ask themselves is not so much in what kind of society do I want to live? But who am I? The two questions are, of course, intimately related. And any sense of social identity must embed an answer to both. But the answer to the question, in what kind of society do I want to live, has become less shaped by the kinds of values or institutions people want to struggle to establish than by the kinds of people they imagine they are. And the answer to the question, who am I or who are we, has become less defined by the kind of society they want to create than by the history and heritage to which they supposedly belong. And it is against this background that the issue of heritage has become so much more important as we define ourselves increasingly by our relationship to the past. So how we understand that past has become more important. That past has also become more contested as we struggle more fiercely to shape the past to suit the present. We imbue every historical object, every historical event, even a skeleton found 10,000 years ago in a cave in southwest England with greater meaning and turn each into a myth, a symbol, to articulate a particular narrative of how we are and how we should be. And in so doing, it seems to me, we diminish and devalue 
the lived experience of history and heritage and belongingness and identity. To explain what I mean, let's consider two debates in two cities at either end of Europe, Cordoba in Spain and Istanbul in Turkey. Cordoba's mosque cathedral is one of the most glorious buildings, not just in Spain, but in all Europe. I mean, I remember it's over 20 years since I was there, but I can still picture it in my mind. You, you walk through this um, grove of orange trees, and suddenly these orange trees give way to the colonnade to the mosque. It's, it's almost magical so it's, as you enter the mosque. And it's a it's a it's, it's a very complex, not just beautiful, it's a very complex architectural structure, but it's a mosque. At the heart of which is a cathedral. And in that sense, it's an architectural expression of the complex, intricate story of Europe. And for some, that's the problem. In recent years, the cathedral chapter of Cordoba, the, the branch of the Catholic Church that administers the site, has slowly wiped away the word mosque from the monument's title and from publications about the site. Officially calling it simply, calling it simply the Cathedral of Cordoba. And according to the official brochure, the site is really Christian, and a Cordoba's Muslim period was but a footnote to the city's Christian history. Stories, of course, far more complex and far more fascinating. The first Muslim armies came to Iberia in the first decade century. And it becomes by the 10th century, perhaps um, Cordoba become by the which became the, the capital of Al Andalus or Muslim Spain had become by the 10th century, possibly the most important city in Europe. And at the heart of the city was the mosque of Quito. It had been built uh, because of Caleb that purchased the church of St. Vincent to erect upon the old church a new mosque and in turn for which the Christians who, who worshipped at the church of St. Vincent were given permission to rebuild another church. And the original mosque was a remarkable architectural hybrid fusing the artistic values of East and West, adopting Roman Visigoth techniques and including elements previously unknown in Islamic religious culture, um, such as use of double arches to support the roof and a blending of stone with brick. And it was not just a religious house, it was also called this university, one of the great centres of learning in the world. And it was held in such esteem, even by Christians, <coughs> that when it was reconquered, by Ferdinand III in 1236. His army did not, as it normally would have done, destroy it. It became a place of Christian worship. But for three centuries, the main structure of Bethlehem was left untouched. In the 16th century, King Carlos V gave permission to the church authorities to repack the centre of the mosque and to um, construct a cathedral. And when Carlos V visited the completed <coughs> cathedral in 1526, he was said to be shocked by the damage wrought to the mosque, exclaiming, you have built here what you or anyone else might have built anywhere else, but you have destroyed what was unique in the world. Now, 3,000 kilometers away, at the other edge of Europe, stands Istanbul, and at the heart of Istanbul, is the glorious Hagia Sophia, one of the great cathedrals of the world. And Istanbul once occupied the same role in Eastern Christendom as Cordoba played in the Western Islamic Empire. And Hagia Sophia, which was Istanbul as a mosquito, was to Cordoba. And in Istanbul today, a similar debate is taking place over its fate, a debate that is a mirror image of the debate in Cordoba. The current church that we know is 
as I Sophia was built on the ruins of two previous churches on the same site. It was commissioned by Emperor Justinian, the last Latin-speaking ruler of what was then the Eastern Roman Empire, and completed in 537. It was said it was built at extraordinary speed in five years. And yet, it's a most remarkable building at once the, the culminating architectural achievement of late antiquity and the first masterpiece of Byzantine architecture. And it casts a shadow, an enduring shadow, upon the Eastern Orthodox, Catholic, and Muslim worlds, influencing the development of both architectural forms of worship in all three of those faiths. Hagia Sophia became the seat of the Orthodox Patriarch of Constantinople, the spiritual heart of the Byzantine Empire. In 1453, the city was captured by the Ottomans. Constantinople was renamed Istanbul, and the name Hagia Sophia became Islamist. And the cathedral itself was turned into Istanbul's first imperial mosque, coming eventually to boast four minarets. After the fall of the Ottoman Empire in 1922 and the abolition of the Caliphate two years later and the establishment of a, of a secular republic of Turkey, the church mosque became a museum in which worship was forbidden. Now, however, there's a campaign to turn Hagia Sophia back into a mosque, backed by President Erdogan and the ruling NKP. And for many Christians, that would be sacrilege. Greece, which sees the monument as part of its own historical heritage too, has condemned it as an insult to the religious sensibilities of millions of Christians. So here we have two cities at opposite ends of Europe, two buildings symbolic of the continent's deeply complex history. Two debates that expose the fractious character of contemporary debates about culture and identity. Two debates that attempt to rewrite the past, to reveal symbols upon which buttress a particular view of the present. And in this process, just as with Cheddar Man, paring down the complexity of history to a simple narrative to fit the needs of the present. In the one case, the Catholic Church attempting to establish the idea of Europe as a Christian continent. On the other, the AKP trying to reinforce the sense of the Muslim foundations of modern Turkey. And these two debates take part in a much broader debate about Europe, its identity, and its heritage. And a broader debate still in the context of contemporary migration into Europe. Many in Europe fear that a continent's identity is being eroded by migration, especially Muslim migration. The late Cardinal Mrs. Bilk, I'm sure I've, I've mispronounced it, and my apologies to any checks here, the Archbishop of Prague until well, 2010, argued that Europe has denied its Christian roots from which it has risen. And he said that at the end of the Middle Ages and in the early modern age, Islam failed to conquer Europe with arms. The Christians beat them. Today, when the fighting is done with spiritual weapons, which Europe lacks, while Muslims are perfectly armed, the fall of Europe is looming. Perhaps nowhere are such fears been felt more than here in Hungary. So Prime Minister Viktor Orban so a couple of years ago, we should not forget that the people who are coming here, and he's talking when the new fences were being put up in Hungary, the people who come here grew up in a different religion and represent a completely different culture. Like, not Christian, but Muslim. And is it not worrying you? that Europe's Christian culture is already barely able to maintain its own set of Christian values. 
And while many in Europe worry about the erosion of the values of Christendom, many of Muslims feel the same about Islam. So you have the terrible destruction by the Taliban of the Buddhas of Bamiya, by the Islamic states of the churches of Mosul and the ancient city of Palmyra, of Malian Islamists, of the library of Timbuktu, which held an astonishing archive of early Islamic and Christian history. All of which speak to a desire to erase a past deemed unacceptable and to create an Islam of myth rather than history. In his book, The, the Fear of Barbarians, the philosopher Svetlana Todorov observes that the world today is structured not so much by ideology as by emotion, and in particular by the emotions of fear and resentment. In the West, he argues, public attitudes and political policies have been shaped by fear of terrorism, of immigration, and of the other, and resentment about the loss of power and prestige abroad, and of the supposed erosion of Western culture at home. Among Muslims, he says, there exists a sense of what he calls humiliation, real or imaginary, which has bred resentment towards Europe and the United States, which are held responsible for pride and misery, public powerlessness. And Todorov, in a sense, makes a similar point to mine, that identity rather than ideology has become the key shaper of contemporary consciousness. And in this process, he observes, people are increasingly drawn to imagining the world as being torn apart by a clash of civilizations. And that was a phrase that was first coined by a historian Bernard Lewis, that was popularized in the 1990s by the American political scientist Samuel Huntington, his famous paper, his famous book. <coughs> The conflict that had convulsed Europe in the past centuries, he argued, were the wars of religion, from the wars of religion between Protestants and Catholics to the Cold War, were all, he said, conflicts within Western civilization. The battle lines of the future, on the other hand, would be, he said, between civilizations, and such struggles would be far more fundamental than any unleashed by political ideologies and political regimes. And Huntington identified a number of distinct civilizations, such as Confucian, Japanese, Buddhist, Hindu, Orthodox, Latin American, and African. The primary struggle, he said, will be between the Christian West and the Islamic East. And it's an idea that's come into vogue in the post 9-11 years, and for many come to define that period after. It has become a means through which to express the sense of fear and resentment of which Todorov writes, a way of understanding notions of belongingness and enmity in emotional rather than ideological terms. But civilizations are never self-enclosed entities. What we call civilizations are complex constructions. They are civilizations precisely because they are porous and fluid, open to wider influences. They borrow and steal and remake each other's jewels. And the more frenetic the borrowing, the more fertile the ground for innovation. The great civilizations develop primarily in those areas where a variety of different peoples and cultures and faiths could meet. One reason that the Eastern Mediterranean was such a forge <coughs> for civilizations, Phoenician, Israel, Babylon, Persia, Greece, Byzantium, and many others, was that it was also the furnace for intellectual and cultural melding. Not only are civilizations culturally and conceptually diverse, but ideas and concepts are historically malleable. Those who talk about a Christian bedrock <coughs> of Europe 
Imagine that there's a lineage that runs back from contemporary European values, back through history, to the origins of Christianity, and beyond that, to Greece and to Judaism. That we should remember that the idea that a Judeo-Christian culture only develops in the 1920s. It's as recent as that. Nobody before the 1920s talked of the Judeo-Christian culture. And it only developed because in America, um, politicians wanted, uh, Roosevelt in particular, wanted a way of bringing together um, American support for uh, opposition to, to Nazis in Europe. And he did so by creating the notion of a Judeo-Christian culture, common Judeo-Christian culture. So when we talk about these kinds of terms, which we think are historically really deep, we, should, we often forget that actually historically very new. And we did, and they, but they become so embedded in our culture that we think that they've always existed. So there is this, this kind of single thread between modern European culture and Christianity in Greece. There are many threads that link the present and the past. Many breaks in those threads. Many through new threads created through history. And nothing expresses that more than the relationship between Christian Europe and Islam. The two may be seen as Conflicting civilizations that for much of the past 1400 years have confronted each other. But in reality, they're also deeply intertwined. Islam draws heavily upon Christian and Jewish stories and concepts. And what is called Christian Europe is deeply embedded to Islam. Take the idea of Greece as the fountainhead of European civilization. Greek philosophy and religion were in fact very different to Christian philosophy and religion. So much so that in the first millennium of Christianity, church leaders were ambiguous about the merits of Greek as pagan knowledge. What is there in common between Athens and Jerusalem? Asked Tertullian, the first significant theologian to write in Latin. It was only in the wake of Thomas Aquinas, and even more so in the wake of the Renaissance, that the idea of European culture's rootedness in ancient Greek became firmly established in public consciousness. A millennium before the Renaissance, as Christendom cleaved into two, as the Roman Empire crumbled, and Christendom cleaved into two, torn between the Eastern and Western churches. Greek thought, especially that of Aristotle, almost disappeared from the Western tradition. And Christian Western Europe rediscovered the Greek heritage, and in particular Aristotle, in the 13th century. A rediscovery that helped transform European intellectual culture. But it did so primarily through the Islamic Empire. Between the 8th and the 13th centuries, the center of learning was not in Athens as it had been before, or Florence as it would be in the, in the, in the centuries to come, but Baghdad and Cordova. Arab philosophy and science played a critical role, not just in preserving the grades of the Greeks, but in genuinely expanding the boundaries of knowledge, both in philosophy and in science, much of which subsequently flow into Western Europe, helping create the frame for the Renaissance and, and the Enlightenment. The rationalist tradition in Islamic thought, culminating in the work of Ibn Sinya and Ibn Rushd. It's this that is barely remembered in the West, yet its importance and influence on the Christian tradition is difficult to overstate. Ibn Rushd especially, the greatest Muslim interpreter of Aristotle came to wield far more influence within Judaism and Christianity, ironically, than he did within Islam. And his commentaries shaped the thinking of a galaxy of thinkers from Aquinas to Maimonides. We talk much these days about Western values and contrast them, or many people contrast them, with Islamic values. 
But what if this graph can describe this Western value, equal rights, for instance, or, or secularism? Would have left many of the key figures of Christianity bewildered. Figures such as Lucas, Aquinas. Such figures, on the other hand, would have understood the Islamic values of Muslim philosophers, such as Ibn Senor Ibn Rushd. And certainly they would have understood them much better than they would of those philosophers who shaped contemporary thinking. Bentham, or Mill, or Sartre, or Heidegger, or Moore, or, or any of those galaxy of thinkers. There is, in other words, no single set of European values that transcends history. Nor is there a single set of Islamic values that transcend history. It is this complexity that is often stripped away in contemporary discussions about European heritage. The contrast to the clash of civilizations is often taken to be multiculturalism, a view of, the, of, of societies is comprising many cultures, each of which helps shape the cultural texture of that society. It's an outlook that those who seek to defend European heritage from Islam fear and detest. Multiculturalism, they argue, is rotting the roots of European heritage, opening it up to be taken over by alien traditions. The irony, however, is that both the clash of civilizations and the multicultural approaches draw upon similar views of culture and identity. In particular, both are rooted in what I'd call the romantic view of culture and of cultural differences. To understand this better, we need a better understanding of what we mean by multiculturalism. And to recognize that multiculturalism possesses two meanings that are often conflated. The first is the lived experience of diversity. The second is multiculturalism as a kind of political process. The aim of which is to manage that diversity. The term multiculturalism embodies both a description of a diverse society and a prescription for dealing with that diversity. That, I want to suggest, is problematic. The experience of living in a society that is less insular, more vibrant, more cosmopolitan, is something to welcome and celebrate. It is a case for cultural diversity, open borders, open minds. As a political process, however, it has come to mean something very different. It means a set of policies which seeks to manage that diversity by putting people into boxes, cultural, faith, ethnic boxes, and to define people's needs or rights by virtue of boxes into which people are being put. So we talk about the Muslim community. We talk about um, different communities as having different <coughs> aspirations or uh, needs or values. And it becomes a case when we look at the world in this way, when we look at culture in this way, not of open borders and minds, but of the policing of borders, whether physical, or cultural, or imaginative. One of the ironies of of this viewpoint is that it undermines much of what is valuable about diversity as lived experience. When we talk about diversity, what we mean is that the world is a messy place. It's full of clashes and conflicts. We disagree with each other. And that's all for the good. Because it is out of that, the clashes and conflicts and disagreement, that's the stuff of political and cultural engagement. Diversity is important, not in and of itself, but because it allows us to expand our horizons, to compare and contrast different values and beliefs and lifestyles, make judgments upon them, decide which may be better, which may be worse, and to have that dialogue and debate in an open, robust fashion. It is important, in other words, because it allows us to engage in political dialogue 
a debate that can help a more universal, create a more universal language of citizenship. But in placing minorities in particular into ethnic and cultural boxes, what that vision of multiculturalism does is it makes it more difficult to have <clears throat> these dialogues and debates. The very valuable thing that is valuable about diversity, the contestations, the dialogue, the disagreements it brings about is what many politicians and policy makers most fear. And that fear takes two forms. <coughs> On the one hand, there is the nativism, the belief that integration is undermining social cohesion, eroding our sense of national identity, and so on. On the other hand, there is the multicultural argument that respect for others requires us to accept their ways of being, not criticise or challenge their practices or, or, or values, but instead to police the boundaries between groups to minimise clashes and conflicts and frictions that diversity brings in its wake. Seems to me that one approach encourages fear, the other kind of indifference. The one approach views migrants as the other, whose otherness poses a threat to European values. The other approach views otherness, the otherness of migrants, as an issue that society must simply respect and live with. The second irony is that while multicultural policies are rooted in the notion of a diverse society, they are at the same time often blind to the diversity of minority communities. On the multicultural map, diversity magically ends at the edges of minority communities. So politicians and commentators tend to treat minority communities as if each was distinct and singular and homogenous and authentic. Each composed of people all speaking with a, a single voice. Each defined primarily by a single view of faith, <laughs> culture, the Muslim community, the African Caribbean community, the Polish community, and so on. All the dissent and diversity get washed out, and as a result, often the most progressive voices often get silenced as not being truly that community, of being truly authentic while the most conservative voices get celebrated as the authentic voices of minority groups. The greatest irony, however, as I've already suggested, is that the clash of civilizations and multiculturalism are both draw upon the romantic, a similar romantic view of culture. Now, romanticism is one of those contexts that cultural historians find invaluable, but which is almost impossible to define. It took many political forms. It lies at the roots of both of modern conservatism and of, and of many strands of radicalism, and it appeared in different national forms. Romanticism was not a, a specific political cultural view, but described instead a culture, a cluster of attitudes and preferences. For instance, for the concrete over the abstract, the unique over the universal, but nature over culture, the organic over the mechanical, emotion over reason, intuition over intellect, particular communities over abstract humanity, and so on. And these attitudes came to the fore towards the end of the 18th century, largely in reaction to the predominant views of the Enlightenment. Now, much has been written about the varieties of values and beliefs and arguments within the 18th century. It's no longer fashionable to talk about the Enlightenment, and quite rightly. Nevertheless, beneath the differences, there were a number of beliefs that, that most of the Enlightenment philosophers held in common, and which distinguished Enlightenment thinkers from both those of the 17th century and those of the 19th. There was a broad consensus that humans possessed a common nature that the same institutions and forms of government would promote human flourishing in all societies, that reason allowed humans to discover those in institutions, and that through the development of such institutions, social inequalities and hierarchies could be minimized, even erased. The romantic challenge the enlightenment, <coughs> challenged all these beliefs, 
Whereas Enlightenment philosophers saw progress as civilization overcoming the resistance of traditional cultures with that, as they saw it, peculiar superstitions or irrational prejudices. For the Romantics, the steamroller of progress and modernity was, but it was what they most feared. Enlightenment philosophers tended to see civilization in the singular. Romantics saw a plurality of cultures, each rooted in a particular people's history and myth. Culture was an expression of differences, not of universals, of a putative past rather than a potential future. And distinct cultures were not, were not aberrant forms to be destroyed, but a precious inheritance to be cherished and protected. I'm here, of course, greatly oversimplifying. The story is much more complicated than simply that kind of binary distinction between Romanticism and the Enlightenment. And in reality, we always need to view culture from both perspectives. Culture expresses a universal human ability, but it's always expressed within particular forms. And it's that getting that relationship right that's always the, the great problem, the great, great challenge of thinking about culture. But for the purposes of this discussion, the romantic enlightenment distinction is a useful frame within which to look at the issue. The philosopher who best articulated the romantic notion of culture was the German, Berder, who rejected the Enlightenment idea that reality was ordered in terms of universal, timeless, objective, unalterable laws that rational investigation could discover, but maintained that every activity, situation, historical period, civilization possessed a unique character of its own. What made each people? or nation or folk unique was particular language, literature, histories, modes of living. And every culture was authentic in its own terms, each adapted to its local environment. Herder occupies an ambiguous role in modern political thought. In the 18th century, Herder saw himself as part of the Enlightenment tradition. He was a great champion of equality, bitterly opposed both slavery, and European colonial treatment of non-Europeans. But he also saw himself as someone forced to challenge some of the basic precepts of the philosophers, such as their stress on universal law and on the universal validity of reason. In the 19th century, Herder's concept of the Volksgeist encouraged, albeit unwittingly, the development of racial science. Volksgeist became transformed into the notion of racial makeup, an unchanging substance, the foundation of all physical appearance and mental potential, and the basis for division and differences between humankind. By the late 19th century, Herder's cultural pluralism came paradoxically, all to give succor to the new anthropological notion of culture, championed by critics of racial science. Franz Boas, the, the German-American anthropologist, <coughs> played a key development in the development of um, uh, key role in the development of cultural anthropology, sought, in the words of the historian George Stocking, to define the romantic notion of the genius of the people in terms other than race. His answer, ultimately, was the anthropological notion of culture, the notion that underlies modern multicultural ideas, pluralist notions as well. And in the 20th century, Herder's relativism and particularism has come to shape much of anti-racist thinking. The roots of barbarism, many have come to believe, lay in Western arrogance, and the roots of Western arrogance lay in an unquestioning belief in the superiority of enlightenment, rationalism, and universalism. If this romantic vision of culture buttresses the argument both of multiculturalism and of nativism. It also shapes much of the discussion on heritage. The 
2003 UNESCO Convention that safeguarding of intangible cultural heritage, for instance, envisions the creation of state folklore protection boards that would register works that authorise their use, could intervene if native art was used in culturally inappropriate context. <coughs> the World in Intellectual Property Organisation is developing a protocol for groups, particularly indigenous groups, that own property rights, traditional knowledge, and cultural expressions. If that knowledge or those expressions have some linkage with a community's cultural and social identity and cultural heritage, and are authentically of that community. The aim is to prevent, without the free, prior, and informed consent of the relevant community, the misappropriation of such heritage. And expressed in all these reports and conventions and protocols is the classic romantic view of culture and knowledge, the notions of a relevant community, of authentic belonging, of culturally inappropriate context, seems to me, are deeply problematic. They are both illusory and dangerous. <coughs> Consider, for instance, the idea of a relevant community. This can only be constituted in a circular argument. Take, an argument, take a, a discussion in which I've been involved for many years. Some Muslims <coughs> regard the depiction of the Prophet Muhammad as blasphemous and hence to be forbidden. To, to depict the Prophet should in their eyes be seen as culturally inappropriate. And many liberals in Europe accept that. Other Muslims, however, see no pro problem in such depictions. And there's in fact a long Muslim tradition, particularly the Shiite traditions, of creating images of Muhammad. But only the former are seen as authentic Muslims, while the latter are seen, often seen as too liberal or westernized to belong to the relevant community. And this, it seems to me, is the kind of herder's vision of the Volksgeist made into the language of the 21st century. And when we talk about identity and of identity politics today, what we often mean is the entrenchment of that romantic view of culture and cultural differences. And it is from this perspective that our relationship to the past is being reshaped. And that seems to be deeply problematic. Culture is our entry ticket to the world, a means of opening it up, of allowing us to engage with it, of expanding our horizons. But too much thinking about heritage and of policy making, both at national and international level, turns culture into a barrier, a means of protecting people from the world. The consequence has been to create cultural enclaves and what we can only call intellectual banter stands. That is why, in my view, we need to reject both the nativist or clash of civilizations approach and the multicultural approach to heritage. In many ways, we are, each of us, like the Cordoba Cathedral Mosque and Istanbul Hagia Sophia. We're each of us complex constructions, each of us with many identities, influences, and sources of heritage. But too often, the way in which we're often regarded by politicians and policy makers, and indeed, in many ways, we often do regard ourselves. It's like the way the Catholic Church <coughs> used the Cathedral Mosque or the Turkish authorities view Hagia Sophia. A singular, with all the complexity washed out, and a symbolic of a myth we want to present about our roots. Unlike the two buildings, however, human beings have agency. We have not simply constructed, we're not simply constructed by others, we construct ourselves. Our sense of who we are, of where we come from, where we belong, and what our values are, are created by ourselves collectively. And we construct ourselves through debate, through dialogue, through contestation. And it seems to me what heritage policy making, what 
what interpretation should be about. Not having that debate for us, or defining how we should think about these issues, but, but using the past to provide the tools and the space that allow us to have that debate in the present. <laughs>